In this presentation, we expand on the idea of force and what Galileo discovered and look at how Newton came along a little bit later and took what he learned from Galileo, experimented a little bit more, and came up with Newton's three laws of motion. So Isaac Newton um, was born just a, I think he was born the year or two, just a little bit after Galileo had passed away. He was a mathematician, physicist, and an astronomer. And he basically fur furthered the work that Galileo had done, um, considering you know, how objects change and what a force is and how a force is used to, um, to change the motion of an object. So Newton's first law of motion is basically just restating what Galileo had um, described in terms of inertia. And so Newton's first law says that an object continues in a state of rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line unless it is acted on by a non-zero net force. So he's just restating that concept of inertia that Galileo came up with um, years ago. And we can reiterate the fact that a force is necessary to change the motion of an object, but it is not necessary to maintain the motion of an object. So the object's moving at a constant speed, and there is no net force acting on the object. And we're going to talk about what this word net means in a little bit. So here are two pictures, and or two animations. And so in this first one, let me just change this to get rid of my pointer. So in this top picture, there's a force of five newtons acting on this crate. The person is going to push on the crate for a short amount of time and then release it. And we can see that the crate continues to move how it was moving before. When the person released it, it continued to move at a constant speed. This animation is stopped. The video was stopped right here. It would actually continue to keep moving. There was nothing that stopped it there. So then I could do the same thing here. Now notice that the force on this one is larger. So the person pushes on the crate, releases, but in this case the crate stops. So what's the big difference between these two? Well in the top picture you'll notice that the surface appears to be blue. And the idea here is, is this is like an icy surface. So there's no friction in this top video picture. Let's go back to my picture pointer. There is no there's no friction up here. So the person changed the motion of the crate, got it moving, stopped pushing, and the crate continued to move at a constant speed in a straight line because there was no force on it to change its motion. In the picture below, the surface is different and there's actually friction. So the person pushed on the crate. <clears throat> when he released the crate, the crate slowed down until it stopped. And so there was an, another force acting on this crate that we couldn't see. So once the person released, there was some friction that actually opposed the motion and caused the crate to stop. And this is why, you know, in nature, this is actually what typically happens. We're not on ice. And so we see, if we just evaluate what we see, we would say, all right, well, if I want to keep this crate moving, I have to apply a force to keep it moving. But that's not true. There's actually other forces involved that we don't see that are affecting the motion of the object. So a force is not required to keep the object in motion or to uh, at a constant speed or to, uh, you know, if it's at rest, there's also no force on that object. So normally if I was teaching um, this material in a face-to-face -face environment, I would show some video demonstrations, or I wouldn't show the video, I would actually do some video demonstrations and also maybe show some video demonstrations. Uh, in order, for the sake of time and not just showing a video on top of a video, I've provided a couple of um, links, and I realize you can't click on these links, but you can certainly write them down, that would show some examples of inertia and how we can um, use this idea that an object at rest remains at rest or moving in a straight line at a constant speed. Uh, one really quick example that you've probably seen before is this idea of setting up a, uh, a table 
uh, setting with a tablecloth underneath and you can, if you do it the right way, you can pull the tablecloth out from underneath and the table setting would still be there. And sometimes you see like old magicians are doing this sort of thing. And it's not magic, it's inertia. So the plate, the cup, the candle, they all have inertia. They have a natural tendency to remain at rest. So when you quickly pull the tablecloth out from underneath, their tendency is to stay in the state that they're in, which is sitting there. And so um, it, there is a quick force applied, but it's very quick. And so essentially they, they move a little bit, but they don't slide off the table. Now, if you were to take that tablecloth and, and pull it very slowly, um, then the whole table setting would actually fall off with the, uh, with the tablecloth. So natural tendency of an object to remain in the state that it's in unless a force is applied. And so if you pull slowly, then you do have a force applied over, over some length of time. So it's a good idea to try to view a few of these videos to see some demonstrations. Newton's second law is the law that we probably use the most in terms of problem solving. And Newton's second law says that the acceleration of an object depends on the net force that's applied on the object, and it's directly proportional to that net force. So the bigger the force is, the greater the acceleration is. But it's also um, inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So the larger the mass of an object, the smaller the acceleration is. And we sort of saw some of that earlier um, in some of the, the previous um, presentations. So, you know, an object that has a very large mass is going to be harder to move, has more inertia, and therefore the acceleration or the change in motion is going to be less if you, um, if you apply the same force on that object versus one that has a smaller mass. So a net force causes a change in the motion, but that acceleration depends on how massive the object is. So here's a, another sort of thought experiment. I have a physics book. I have my crate. I apply the same force on both of these. And we know that under these circumstances that the one kilogram textbook is going to experience a greater change in motion and therefore it's going to have a larger acceleration because acceleration measures how the motion changes. And the crate, which has a larger mass associated with it, will have a less acceleration because it has more mass associated with more inertia. It's harder to change its motion. So we learned from this that the acceleration, same force applied, that the acceleration will be different for these two objects, even though the same force is applied, and that acceleration depends on the mass. So the larger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. On the other hand, if we took two identical crates and we applied a force on one crate and then we applied twice the force on the other crate, these two crates would experience a different change in motion. The crate that has twice the force on it is going to experience a greater change in motion. And so we would say that that particular crate has a greater uh, acceleration associated with it. More force on an object implies more acceleration, so they are proportional to one another. So we can write down uh, an equation that describes Newton's second law, and that equation says that the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass, so the mass is on the bottom of the expression, and it is directly proportional to the net force. So as F gets bigger, as the force gets bigger, the acceleration gets bigger. And on the other hand, as the mass gets bigger, the acceleration gets smaller. I also should point out that acceleration, of course, is a vector quantity. It has both size and direction associated with it. And that's also true with force. So force is a vector quantity. So if you push something to the right, it might move to the right. If you push something to the left, it's going to move to the left. So that force does have size and direction. In terms of units, we use the standard units in physics for acceleration, which is meters per second squared. For mass, we use kilograms. And if we rearrange the expression um, that we have for Newton's second law and we multiply both sides by mass, we get another way that we can write Newton's second law, which is the sum of the forces that are acting on that object. The force acting on the object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. So the units for force 
are the units for mass times acceleration. So that would be units of mass of kilograms times acceleration, which is meters per second squared. So if I multiply a unit of a kilogram and a meter per second squared, I get a new defined unit called a newton. So in physics, we will always use the standard units for force as newtons. Now when we say net force, what we mean is that there can be multiple forces that are acting on an object at the same time. And the net force is the sum or the addition of all these forces that are acting, but we have to make sure that we take into account direction. So you could have something like a tug of war where people are pulling in both directions and the object isn't moving. And so even though there are individual forces acting on an object, the net force or the sum of those forces might be zero. We also have to treat up and down motion separate from left and right. So similar to projectile motion where the horizontal and the vertical motions are independent of one another, we do the same thing when we look at um, forces here. If we have forces along the horizontal direction, left-right motion, we think of those separately than the up and down motion. Okay, so now we can look at Newton's second law of motion with a couple of conceptual examples, examples where we actually maybe put in some numbers as well. So suppose we start off and we have a hand that's applying a force on a brick. Um, in this particular case, um, we could imagine that the force being applied is a one Newton force and that the brick has a mass of one kilogram. And we might be interested in how is this brick going to accelerate? Let's assume that the brick is on an ice surface so there's no friction or anything like that. So we know that the acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. The force is one Newton, the mass is one kilogram, and so I get a uh, acceleration of one meter per second squared. And the question then arises is, suppose we apply twice as much force. Well, it turns out that if I apply twice as much force to that brick, it's going to produce twice as much acceleration. Well, how can, I, how can I imagine doing that in terms of numbers? So we just put some random numbers in here. We always like to use easy numbers like 1. So now, suppose we went through that same process. Suppose we have twice as much force that's applied to the same brick. So the force is twice as big, 2 newtons, and it has a mass the same as before. Then we can do the same thing and we can find the acceleration, except it's 2 newtons over 1 kilogram. And so the acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. So this acceleration is twice as big as the acceleration that I started with when I only applied a single force on there of 1 newton. Suppose that I wanted to compare again to the first case. Suppose I apply twice as much force, but now I have twice, I have two bricks, so I have twice as much mass. Well, it turns out that I get exactly the same acceleration here as I would have had to start with. So now I look at this and I say, all right, well, I have twice as much force, two newtons. The mass is two kilograms. So my acceleration is two newtons over two kilograms which is one meter per second squared. So I get exactly the same acceleration that I started with, meaning that the acceleration hasn't changed from the situation where I have the single brick with the single force. All right, let's look at some other cases. So here we still have our single force, single brick. Suppose that I apply the same force to two bricks. So what happens to the acceleration? So I have a force of one Newton, but the, I have two bricks, so I have two kilograms, so one newton over two kilogram is one half meter per second squared, or 0.5. So how does this compare to the original? Well, the acceleration is now half as much. So if I have twice as much mass, I get half the acceleration, assuming I apply the same force. Could go through the same thing. Suppose I have three bricks and I apply the same force. Well, I have a force of one newton. I have three times as much mass. So now my acceleration has reduced by a third. So compared to the original one, this acceleration is a third. So three times as many bricks causes the acceleration to, to decrease by a factor of a three or it decreases by one third.
So remember that as you see questions that examine, you know, what happens to this quantity if I double this other quantity? That you can always throw some numbers in and just make sure you put some easy numbers in to start with, like one is always easy. Figure out what that value would be and then see what happens when you change the values. So in this case, you know, we doubled the bricks, so I doubled the mass, and I can see how that affects the acceleration compared to what I started with. So what does this idea of net force actually mean? So you can have more than one force applied on an object. And so when we talk about the net force or the net equivalent force, what we mean is how can we take these forces that are acting on this block and draw it or describe it as just a single force. And so we have to take into account direction. Both of these are pointing to the right. So the individual forces here, 5 and 5, would be equivalent to 10. On the other hand, in this picture, I have five newtons going to the right and five newtons going to the left. So the net equivalent on this block is zero because these two forces will cancel each other out. One is pulling one direction, the other is pulling the other direction. So there's not going to be any sort of net total amount of force on that block, which means that if it's not moving, it's not going to move. And that's the same thing as equivalent to zero force. Over here I have 10 newtons acting to the right, I have 5 newtons acting to the left. If you were to pull with these forces, this block should move to the right, and that's equivalent to a total amount of force of 5. In other words, this 10 newtons is positive, this one I can think of as negative, and when I add them together I get a total of only 5 newtons acting to the right. So equivalent force means you can take multiple forces that are acting on an object, and you can describe them as a single force that's acting on the object. But how do we do this more formally? So in a more formal situation, we have to make sure that we think about um, using positive and negative signs with force. So force is a vector quantity. And so if I am going to determine the net force acting on an object, we write the net force as this summation symbol with the force. And what we have to do is we have to look at our picture and we have to decide if the force is pointing in the positive direction or the negative direction. And according to our coordinate systems that we've used in the past, the positive direction horizontally is to the right and the negative direction is to the left. So if I determined the net force on this block, it would have a positive force, F1, acting to the right, and then I would add to it, because this just means sum them up, a force acting to the left, which is a negative quantity. So my net force is a positive 15 plus a negative 5 acting to the left, which gives me a total net force of 10 newtons acting to the right. So I could replace both of these with just 10 newtons acting to the right. We also have to realize that the horizontal and the vertical motions are independent of one another, so I have to treat them as such. So if I were to sum my forces in the right-left direction, just like the previous slide, I would have a, a positive 15 to the right, a negative 5 to the left, and when I add them together I get a net force of po positive 10 newtons, which means that it's acting to the right, and separately I would have to look at the up-down motion. So the three newtons, positive direction is always in the upward direction, and so that we've looked at, at least in the past. So the three newtons would be a positive value, and the four newtons, which is acting down or pulling down, would be in the negative direction. So if I sum these forces up, I have three plus a negative four, which gives me a negative one, which means that this object experiences a net force downward of one newton. So I could replace the forces that were in that picture with a 10 newton force to the right and a one newton force down, and it's exactly the same as the original picture in terms of the net force. After we get to this point, we don't try to add the 10 and the 1 together. We keep them separate, 
and we think about those motions, horizontal and vertical, separate from one another. You can have multiple forces acting on an object and have zero net force, which is what's happening here. So the 10 newtons to the right and the 10 newtons to the left add together to give zero. The 5 newtons up and the 5 newtons down also add up to zero. So you can have individual forces acting on an object and still have a net force or a total amount of force of zero. So that is equivalent, my original picture is equivalent to the block with the forces shown, which is just zero force. So this object, because the net force is zero, it means that there is no acceleration. So anytime the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero. And that means that this object is either at rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line. Next, we consider an example of Newton's second law applied to a particular problem. So we have a, uh, an example where Lisa pushes a box across a frictionless level surface with a force of 1.2 newtons. And we know the box has a mass of four kilograms. And the question is, what is the acceleration of the block? So we know that acceleration depends on the net force that's applied and also the mass of the object that the force is applied to. So in our example, we know that the only force that's acting along the horizontal direction is 1.2 newtons because it is a smooth surface. And we know the mass is four kilograms. So we can determine the acceleration as the force over the mass, which is 0.3 meters per second squared. Another question we could ask is how fast is this box moving after 10 seconds if the box started from rest? So if there's a net force acting on the block and it, um, and it started from rest, then it's going to accelerate. And if it accelerates, that means that its velocity is changing. And so in this case, it has a constant acceleration because the force is constant. And an acceleration of 0.3 meters per second squared means that the velocity increases by 0.3 meters per second every second. So if it starts from rest, after one second, it would be traveling at 0.3 meters per second. After two seconds, it would be traveling at 0.6 meters per second. At three seconds, it would be traveling at 0.9, and so on. But we'd like to be able to solve this problem um, more generally, so if the time was not in an equal second interval. So we can write down what we know, and we know that it, the object starts from rest. It has an acceleration of 0.3 meters per second squared, and the time interval we're looking at is 10 seconds. And we're interested in knowing how fast is this thing moving? What is its velocity after that 10 seconds? So we go back to our definition of acceleration, which measures how the velocity changes with respect to time. So we actually now have sort of two formulas for acceleration. One is related to the forces that are being applied on the object and relating to its mass, and the other is just describing the acceleration in terms of how the motion changes. So here, we can uh, multiply both sides by time, and we get an expression that the acceleration times the time is equal to the change in the velocity. So our acceleration is 0.3, our time is 10 seconds, and our initial velocity is zero, so 0.3 times 10 is 3 meters per second. So our velocity after 10 seconds has passed is 3 meters per second. Here we have another example. Uh, in this case, Lisa pushes a large crate of books across her dorm dormitory floor with a force of 5 newtons. So there's a force to the right of 5 newtons. There's also a frictional force of 1.5 newtons that opposes the motion. And it says if the crate has an acceleration of 0.5 meters per second squared, what has to be the mass of this crate? So here is a slightly different problem where we know the net force and the acceleration and we're trying to find the mass. So the first step would be to determine what is the actual net force acting on this block or this crate. So I have 5 newtons, which is acting to the right, so it's positive, and acting to the left, I have the frictional force, and so I have to put that in as a negative force. And I add those two together, and I get a net force of 3.5. So the 5 and the 1.5 together 
are equivalent to 3.5 newtons acting to the right. Once I know what the force is, I can go back to Newton's second law, which says that the force acting on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. It's just a slightly different way of writing Newton's second law. Our net force is 3.5 newtons. It's equal to the mass times our acceleration, which is given in this case. So if I divide both sides by 0.5, I end up getting that the mass of this crate is 7 kilograms. As a quick review of some of the topics that we covered in this lecture, we could ask some quick uh, review questions. So I have a block of ice that's moving to the right on a very smooth surface at a constant speed, and the question is which of the following statements is true? So there's a couple of things that are important. Um, the first thing, of course, or the most important thing, is it's moving at a constant speed. And so if something is moving at a constant speed, that means that the acceleration is zero, because acceleration measures how the velocity changes and it's not changing. And if the acceleration is zero, that also means the net force acting on the object is also zero. So this constant speed is telling us a, a lot of information uh, about the motion of the object. In this question, we have a penny and a brick, which experience the same force directed to the right, and we're asked basically which of the following statements is true. The penny has a greater inertia, the brick has a greater of inertia, or both have the same inertia. Well, they both experience the same force, but that doesn't mean they have um, the same inertia. And in fact, the fact that they experience a force has nothing to do with their inertia. Inertia is based on an object's resistance to change, and in general, it's measured by the mass. A penny has a very small mass compared to the brick. The larger the mass, the larger the inertia. So the brick has a greater inertia in this problem. So we have basically a very similar question here. Same penny, same brick, same force applied, except we want to know which of the statements below are true. So does the penny experience a greater change in motion? The brick experience a greater change in motion? Or do they both have the same change in motion? So they have the same force applied, but we just said that they don't have the same inertia. So the penny has a much smaller mass than the brick, and we know that acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So the smaller the mass, the greater the acceleration, the greater the change in motion. So the penny, in this case, would have the greater change in motion.